Welcome to Washington Hospital Today, the program dedicated to sharing timely information about the community hospital that's been taking care of Washington Township Healthcare District residents since it opened in 1958. Washington Hospital Today is provided for the sole purpose of informing residents about healthcare topics and issues that have been covered during community forums, free health and wellness classes, or as part of educational sessions held during the district's open board meetings. This program is one more way that Washington Hospital helps empower you, the residents of the district, by providing information needed to make informed decisions about your health. Today's presenter is Dr. Anna Malai Verapan. Dr. Verapan is board certified in internal medicine and gastroenterology. He received his medical degree from the University of Madras in India. He completed his residency in New York at LaGuardia Hospital, an affiliate of Cornell University, and his specialty training at Beth Israel Medical Center. Dr. Verapan has extensive skills in minimally invasive endoscopic procedures, with a special interest in pancreatic biliary endoscopy. Dr. Vera Pan is the medical director for the Washington Gastroenterology Service. My topic today is uh, Crohn's disease. There is a condition called inflammatory bowel disease. And the, as the name implies, it causes inflammatory changes in the bowel wall, both the small bowel as well as large bowel. And there are two main conditions that causes inflammatory bowel disease. One is called Crohn's disease. The other one is called ulcerative colitis. Ulcerative colitis causes disease mainly in the large bowel, that is the colon. And um, Crohn's disease can cause disease anywhere from the mouth to the anus. We're going to focus on Crohn's disease today. Crohn's is, um, it's, he, is a, he was a gastroenterologist who practiced in the uh, 30s and 40s. Uh, he, along with two other uh, gastroenterologists, uh, discovered this disease. So it goes by his name. They were at Mount Sinai Hospital in New York. Before I Develop into the topic, I, I thought I'll just um, show you the, the anatomy of the uh, uh, GI tract. So it starts in the mouth, goes down this foot pipe called esophagus. Then you have stomach. The stomach leads to small bowel, the several feet of small bowel. That, that ends in the large bowel, which we call it colon, and those, that goes around the abdomen, then, through, then the rectum, then uh, anus. What is Crohn's disease? This is a disease, this is an autoimmune disease. Uh, we all have immune system. The immune system help us, helps us to fight the infections. It also helps to take care of uh, bad cells in our body. Bad cells, I mean, if, if the cell is going to become cancerous or something, it'll kill those cells. That's how the immune system protects us. Sometimes the immune system recognizes certain parts of the body to be foreign to our body and fights with it. And, and that's, that's how the autoimmune disease develops. So when the immune system recognizes a portion of your body as a foreign substance, it produces um, uh, a chemical materials that will cause destruction of the organ or body. In Crohn's, in Crohn's disease, it affects the bowel. And, uh, and uh, it tells the bowel, you don't belong here. I'm going to get rid of you. And the bowel says, no, I belong here. I, uh, so the bowel fights with the immune system and the end result will be inflammation of the bowel. And that's how you get inflammation, ulceration, bleeding, and all the symptoms, all the disease process starts after that. 
there are a lot of autoimmune diseases that affect our body. There are like thyroid uh, diseases or autoimmune disease, diabetes, autoimmune disease, lupus, rheumatoid arthritis. These are all autoimmune diseases. The exact cause of this disease is unknown. There are various theories about it. One of them is it could be a viral infection. Some say it could be a bacterial infection. And I don't think we have identified any, any, any bug as, as the cause of this uh, disease. The, the research is still going on in this field, uh, trying to identify the cause of this so that the treatment can be effective. Family history. This disease runs in some families. And when um, it gets the, the, the affected gene gets transmitted to other offsprings, and, and um, some families, a bunch of people have the Crohn's disease. This disease is common in, in uh, it's common here in North, North America, Europe, and it's more common in actually Jewish population. It's, mu it's uh, much less in uh, Afro-Americans, Hispanics, and Asians. But nobody's immune to it. Uh, I've, I've seen it in, in all ethnic uh, um, uh, patients. So what happens is the immune system, patients who get this disease have a susceptibility to this disease. It's not, it gets manifested, it gets, um, people get this disease when they have some sort of trigger uh, that occurs in their life. It could be an infection, it could be a toxic uh, exposure to something, but very often it is infection that unmasks this disease. Very often people will say, well, I went to Mexico uh, on a trip, I came back, I, have, I had diarrhea, I went to my primary doctor, he ran a lot of tests on me and he couldn't find a reason for it. I still have diarrhea. It has been several weeks since I returned from Mexico. So, so in, in these patients, what happens is this infection unmasks the, the disease. The infection becomes the trigger to activate the immune mechanism. That's how the disease uh, becomes, uh, comes to light. So <clears throat> like I said, the inflammation uh, of the lining of the bowel occurs in Crohn's disease. There are four layers in the bowel. In Crohn's disease, all the four layers are affected. So it can sometimes the inflammation is so can be severe enough to put a hole through the bowel wall. Whereas with ulcerative colitis, only the innermost layer is affected. The ulcerative colitis mainly affects the colon. It does not affect any other parts of the bowel. So Crohn's disease, about 80% 80 80 of the time, it affects the small bowel alone. 20% of the time, it affects colon alone. About 50% of the time, it affects both the colon and small bowel. That is, end of the colon, that's called ileum, and big, beginning of the colon. So both are affected. That is, we call it as ileocolitis. That occurs in about 50% of the patients. And some patients, in addition to this, they may have anal and rectal disease. This anal and rectal disease can manifest as a little cracks in the anal canal, painful cracks. We call it fissures. More than that, they get what we call it as a fistula. Fistula is a, like a tunnel-like passage that is created by this disease. When the disease goes through the bowel wall, it goes past it and burrows a hole through the tissues adjacent to the bowel. And either it can connect to different parts of the bowel or different organs in the belly, or it can come through the skin to the outside. When the same thing happens, in, it can happen in the rectal region too. It comes out of the rectum, burrows a hole through the tissues, and shows up in the buttocks region or in the surrounding the anal region, you'll see openings. And I'll show you some of those pictures. They are not pretty, but I'll show you in a minute. And less than 5% of the time, the rest of the upper GI tract gets affected. That is the esophagus, the stomach, and maybe beginning part of the small bowel. Those are not common areas, the Crohn's effects. 
Crohn's affects mostly small bowel and to some extent colon and rectum. The, this is the rectal disease I was talking to you about, anal fistulas and abscesses in Crohn's disease. This is an abscess. Abscess is a pus collection. This is it's going to put a hole through and, and come out of here. The hole will come out of here. And these are areas that actually already has holes. You know, the rectum is here, and the, you have holes in other areas. And this is going to put a hole here. And these are some skin tags after when some of these things, when it heals, it can leave little tissues, skin tissues. There's another one that shows there's a big hole here. There's another big hole. These are little ulcers here. What are some of the symptoms? Abdominal pain. Pain can occur any parts of the abdomen. But since most of the disease occurs in the small bowel, on the end of the small bowel, and the beginning of the colon, very often people will have pain in the right lower side of the abdomen. When it puts a hole through the bowel wall, when it forms abscess um, or inflammation outside of the bowel, you can have pain there. Depending upon the site of the bowel, the, pain may, the site of the pain may vary. Diarrhea is, a, is the other common symptom one has. Because of the inflammation, it pours out a lot of fluid into the gut. And so that comes out as a liquid stool. Because the colon you normally absorbs this fluid, but it may be the colon may be diseased or colon's capacity is reached, so you have diarrhea at that point. Bleeding. You can see bleeding, but bleeding is not a very predominant symptom in this condition. Maybe minimal bleeding, maybe a microscopic bleeding, uh, but large amount of bleeding doesn't uh, happen that often. But ulcerative colitis. You, you, you can have a significant amount of bleeding. There are many similarities as well as uh, differences between ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease. Anorectal symptoms, mainly pain, bleeding, discharge, and that sort of stuff. Looking at the picture, you will understand why one would have that. And you can also have fever, weight loss, Fatigue, um, patients la lose appetite or when they eat they get more symptoms so, so they don't, they're afraid to eat and they lose weight. Fever is another sign of active disease and high grade fever can be due to abscess when, when, the, when the pus collection occurs anywhere in the belly you can have high grade temperature. Extra intestinal symptoms. These are outside of the GI tract. One can have disease and symptoms related to that. Arthritis is one of them. It can affect the spine, especially the lower uh, spine. Um, it can also affect jo multiple joints in our body. The main joints that are affected are hip joint, knees, and to less, less extent, other joints in our body. And you can have actual, actually swollen, painful joints as a result of this arthritis. And when these, uh, this arthritis acts up, when the disease is acting up. When the disease is under control, the arthritis gets better. Eye involvement, it can cause inflammation of the eye layers of the eyeball. Let me show you some pictures on that. This is the redness that you see. This is. Um, as you know, this is eyelid, this is the eyeball, and it's all red here. And the, the, this, this is the iris. And inside there is, there is inflammation. You cannot really see it well on this picture. But, but this, this, this we call it uveitis or iritis. And this is also inflammation again. This is the white part of the eye. These are all red things that are all inflamed blood vessels that shows inflammation in this outer layer of your eyeball. And you can have a skin involvement. Skin, there are tender, red, uh, bumpy uh, nodules you get. That's quite tender. Again, this ref 
when uh, this goes away when the disease gets under control. This is also a skin disease that occurs. It's a very, very nasty skin disease. This, we call that as a pyoderma gangrenosum. Gangrene, actually, gangrene of the skin and the deeper layer tissues occurs. It's somewhat f frustrating to treat. It's a very painful condition. Sometimes even getting the disease under control may not control this disease. It's a very difficult to treat, very painful condition. You can have ulcers, like, like a can canker sores. You can have ulcers in your, in your mouth. Uh, they, they can be very painful. So I talked about arthritis, eye involvement, skin. It can affect the liver, the bile ducts. Bile is, bile is produced in the liver. It comes through a little tube called bile duct. That bile duct can be inflamed. It can get scarred. And you can, you can have a liver disease as a result of that. Sometimes it can be severe enough to require even transplant, and sometimes the bile ducts uh, can cause uh, cancers. Blood clots. People are more prone to have blood clots because the blood is thicker than normal. They get blood clots in the legs and the lungs. Kidney stones occurs very commonly. Not commonly, it occurs uh, in this condition. How do we diagnose this? We do blood tests. The blood test will show uh, blood count, white blood cell count may be higher than normal, indicative of inflammation as well as infection. We can have low uh, hemoglobin because of bleeding, blood loss, as well as inflammation itself causes low blood count. ESR is erythrocyte sedimentation rate, and CRP, these are two different blood tests that measures the inflammation in the body when, the, when these are elevated, we can tell that the disease is active. So we monitor, when we give treatment to the patient, we monitor this blood test to see whether or not they're improving or getting worse. And B12 can be low in this situation when the end of the small bowel is diseased. That's where the B12 gets absorbed. You can have a low B12. Iron because of blood loss. Colonoscopy is one of the ways that we find out whether someone has colitis. When we do colonoscopy, we can also get inside the end of the small bowel, and that's where most of the time Crohn's disease is found. So we can take biopsies, and the bi <clears throat> biopsies will give us the diagnosis. It will not confirm, but it will give us the suggestion that we're dealing with the Crohn's disease. This is how we do colonoscopy. We ask patients to take uh, laxatives to clean the colon out. Then we give intravenous sedation to make them sleepy, groggy. Then we pass a flexible tube through the rectum to go all the way up to the very beginning of the colon. This is the end of the small bowel. The scope can get inside this area of the small bowel. That's where more often you'll have disease. And we can take biopsies to, to, uh, to make the diagnosis. And this is how it appears on colonoscopy. You can have a little ulcers. This is a mild form of colitis. You can have deeper ulcers. And you can have numerous big ulcers. This is cobblestone appearance, we call it. This is some of these things that are normal tissue. And you can have narrowing or stricturing or, or narrowing of the opening of the colon because of scarring. This is a barium enema, which is a different form of uh, x-ray. It's an x-ray test to look at the colon. This is a, we, put, we ask patients to clean the colon out. Then we put a white chalky fluid. When you take the x-rays, this is how the colon gets uh, seen on the x-ray. These are all scarring areas that we see because of the Crohn's disease. This is also, again, the barium enema showing some areas of ulcerations. And <clears throat> this is again a barium enema. This shows the fistula. The fistula is a, I told you, it's a, it's a tunnel. It's a tract that, that can connect it between different organs, or it can come out through the skin to the outside. It can connect small bowel to small bowel, small bowel to colon, colon and small bowel to the urinary bladder. When it happens, uh, you not only pass urine, you also pass gas as well as stool. It can connect to the vagina, and stool can come out of the vagina. 
and th this is called fistula. So this is uh, an example of a fistula where one part of the bowel and the other part of the bowel are being connected by this abnormal tract or tunnel. And also it can put a hole through, and this we call it an abscess. This is a pocket of pus collection. Now because of the hole, the barium goes through it and fills it and shows us as an abscess. This is a capsule test where there's a pill camera. You swallow the pill cap camera. This goes down. This is a very useful test for small bowel evaluation. Small bowel is much, seen much better this way than, than any other way. It swallows, you swallow the capsule, it tumbles down, it's got a camera in it, and it takes pictures. It takes up approximately 50,000 pictures in about eight hours' time, and that images the entire colon. And when we feed it into the computer, we can see it as a live video of the small bowel uh, anatomy. This is how the small bowel looks. All these white areas are all ulcers in the small bowel. So I talked about the capsule endoscopy, colonoscopy, imaging studies, that is CAT scan, MRI, barium studies. Barium studies I've showed, showed it a few minutes ago. CAT scan <clears throat> can tell us what part of the bowel is involved, whether or not there is abscess there, whether or not there is any communication there between the bowel wall, between the bowel loops. And MRI, MRI enterography we call it, that is to image the small bowel that's an excellent test to look at the small bowel. It looks at all the four layers of the small bowel. It tells us what part of the small bowel is affected, how much is because of inflammation, how much is because of scarring. Because scarring, we cannot give medication to, to get rid of the scarring. Inflammation, we can. So when someone has a problem, we do MRI and find out how much of inflammation one has. If they have a lot of inflammation, not much scarring, we can give medications to get rid of the inflammation so that the, the lesion heals and the person feels better. If it is all scarred, any amount of medication is not going to help. So it's a, it's a waste of time, waste of money, and unnecessary medication side effects. So we would like to avoid that in that situation. When you have scarring, you, you're, you're better off having surgery to remove the scarring rather than try these important uh, serious medications. An antibody test. These are some of the tests that are available. They, some of them do indicate that they, they have Crohn's disease, but it is not mature enough to be used widely. Still a lot of uh, investigations need to be done. Sometimes we do this in some special situations when we are not, when you are doubtful about this. It gives us another indication that it could be Crohn's disease, but this is something that we don't we don't routinely use. Stool markers <clears throat> is, some, is, is, is something that tells us that the colon is inflamed. Um, more than that, it doesn't tell us anything. Differential diagnosis is something that we talk about. Whenever we have a diagnosis, we want to make sure that we are not dealing with any other diagnosis. How do we make sure that other diagnoses are excluded? Uh, when someone has a condition, we, want to, we, we say, yes, it looks like Crohn's disease. Someone will ask, how do you know this is Crohn's? Why can't it be this? Why can't it be that? So that's what we call it as a differential diagnosis. Irritable bowel syndrome is a very common condition where one gets abdominal pain, diarrhea, uh, but their bowel is completely normal. You will not see anything abnormal with their bowel in any any form of any kind of test that you put them through, CAT scan, MRI, colonoscopy, any of those tests, and the blood test, everything will be normal. And um, it's a very common condition. It occurs in the same age group as the in Crohn's disease. Sometimes it's confused. Sometimes people think that they have Crohn's disease and happens to be irritable bowel syndrome, the vice versa. Lactose intolerance, I mean milk intolerance, is something that causes Again, abdominal pain, bloating, diarrhea. So people are confused with that. And uh, patients with Crohn's disease, they're also, lact some of them are lactose intolerant. Sometimes both conditions coexist co in some patients. <clears throat> Infectious colitis. This is something that presents as diarrhea, bleeding, fever, uh, abdominal pain. Uh, again, if you do stool studies, you'll find the pathogen that is causing the colitis. 
causing the um, uh, symptoms. Um, infectious colitis, very often <clears throat> either it is self-limited or we can give appropriate treatment to get rid of the infection. They'll feel better and they won't have any more problems after that. Ulcerative colitis, I told you, is another disease like Crohn's disease. It's got some differences. It have mainly affects the colon. When you have a small bowel involvement, that means it's not ulcerative colitis. How do we treat this condition? We treat this condition with uh, multiple medications. We, we give, initially we give uh, medications called 5-ASA. That's a medication that is, um, it's an anti-inflammatory medication. Um, it rarely causes side effects. It treats mild disease. It does not take care of moderate or severe disease. There is some controversy whether or not it really helps Crohn's disease. Ulcerative, ulcerative colitis definitely helps. In Crohn's disease, it helps the colonic involvement. When the colon is involved, it helps. Small bowel, we're not sure whether it helps or not. Antibiotics like uh, Cipro and Flagyl we give. When, when, the, when the aminosalicylate does not control it, we try this in addition to that. The, there are various theories about it. We think there may be some bacterial component to it. Giving antibiotics would help. Or there may be, it is burrowing through already, giving you um, infection uh, surrounding the bowel. So that can make things worse uh, in those patients. So giving antibiotics would help to uh, get rid of that infection, make them feel better. The third is corticosteroids. There are two kinds of steroids. One is a prednisone, other one is butasonide. Prednisone is the common cortisone pills that we give for various conditions. And it's got side effects. We start off with a high dose. And over a period of about two to three months, we taper it off. It really helps. It takes care of the inflammation. And there are serious side effects. Weight gain, increase in blood pressure, uh, diabetes, worsens the diabetes. And uh, you're more prone for infections because of this. And it can thin the bones. This is something that we give to bring down the inflammation immediately and we don't like to give it long term. And it doesn't help to give long term. Butasonide is another kind of cortisone. It, is, it goes through the liver, and the liver destroys this medication so that it doesn't get into your system. So the side effects are much less with the butasonide than with the prednisone. But it's also a little less effective than prednisone. Immunomodulators is the next uh, category of medication that we use. These suppress the immunity. Your immune system is suppressed because of this. That's how it, it improves the condition. These are 6-MP and azathioprine. These are kind of uh, similar medications. One is a derivative of the other. Methotrexate is another medication. These medicines have been used in cancer treatment. And uh, these medications primarily we use in this condition as well as the rheumatological conditions like rheumatoid arthritis and lupus. And again, these things have side effects. They suppress the bone marrow. It can drop your blood count. Some, rarely it can wipe out the bone marrow completely. It also makes you more prone for infections. And sometimes you can get a type of tumor called lymphoma, a lymph node tumor sometimes. And the last is biologic therapies. This has been around for the last 10 years or so. We're coming out of the more and more of these medications. These are very effective medications. They're also immunosuppressant medications. They also have side effects like the immunomodulators that I talked to you about. But it doesn't affect the bone marrow that much. But the infection is, is, it can be a serious problem. And also, um, Tumors, so lymphoma, is, is an issue with this. Um, but the incidence of these tumors are not very high, very uh, small, but the risk is there. 
Traditionally, what we have done is we've done step-up therapy, meaning that we start off with the simple medication first, then we add other medication on top of that in people don't respond to it. That is called step-up therapy. And lately, we, we are doing the opposite. That is, if you can identify people who have severe disease and are expected to do worse in the long run, we think hitting them with a very potent medication right off the bat helps them in the long run. It suppresses the disease so that they don't get, the damage doesn't occur, and in the long term, maintaining them will prevent them from getting serious complications. So that is top-down therapy. These are the two kinds that we use. We still use step-up therapy, but in specific conditions like someone who is 20 years old who has fistulas and all the serious problems, the, the, we know that this person is in trouble in the next 40, 60 years, they're going to be in big trouble and they're going to get into major complications and needing surgery, repeated surgery, this and that. We would like to avoid that. We would rather give them the more potent, most potent biologic therapy first to get the disease under control and maintain them that way so that they don't get into trouble. Maintenance therapy. This disease, unfortunately, it's a chronic disease. There's no cure for it. We can give medication to keep them disease-free, symptom-free, so that they can have normal life. And uh, so that's why we give medications to maintain this. Once, when they have the disease, we give these medications to heal all, all the inflamed bowel, make them feel better. Then we give these medications as a maintenance so that they don't get these attacks again. And unfortunately, these medications are given lifelong. Surgical therapy. Well, there are certain situations the surgical therapy is necessary. We think about 70% of these patients at some point in their life will require surgery. I told you the, the inflammation that occurs in the bowel can involve the entire bowel wall so when it heals, it can heal by scarring. When it heals by scarring, the tubular structure becomes narrower. So when it is narrow, that causes problem because of blockage. When there's scarring that causes blockage, the only way to relieve that is by surgery. Medication will not improve the situation. So if you do surgery, what they do is they remove the segment that is blocked and connect the, the other two ends. That's how the blocked segment is removed and your continuity is maintained. Unfortunately, the disease can come at the site where they connected the bowel. That's why we need the maintenance therapy so that they don't get the disease again. And we can't keep cutting these bowel. At some point, you're going to run out of bowel or you're going to have very short bowel and that itself causes problem because you can't digest food, it just runs through you, you get malabsorption. So we try to preserve the bowel as much as we can. We try to avoid surgery as much as we can. So we do this as a last resort in many situations. If you have abscess, that is pus collection, we try to drain it without surgery. But if that's not successful, we may have to do surgery. We try to preserve the bowel, I said, even in the scarred situation, what we try to do is we, instead of cutting out the segment that is, that is scarred, we cut the bowel lengthwise and join it crisscross. I mean, the other, the, the, the other direction, perpendicular to that, we join the bowel so that the bowel is opened up and you're not losing the bowel. So that is, that is, that is an innovative way of doing the surgery. In some situations, we're not able to keep the continuity of the bowel. We may have to do what we call it as a colostomy. That is, the bowel comes and we make a hole on the abdominal wall and bring up, bring up the colon to the outside. And th this is where the stool comes out and you put a bag. Prognosis. Well, 
about 10% of the patients may have one attack and may not have another attack. They are the lucky ones. There are about 5% of the patients are unlucky ones where the attack never resolves. The fortunately majority of them were able to control and keep the disease under control with the medications we have. They still get exacerbations and remission. That is the typical course. You get attack, we give the medication, calm it down. They may go on for a long period of time without getting another attack. They may get another attack at some point in their life. So that, that's a typical course one has. Like I said, many patients may require surgery. What can one do to, to um, minimize the problem? Cut down on the foods that, that uh, causes your symptoms, wor make your symptoms worse. Lactose, I told you, sometimes high fiber diet can do that. Regular exercise helps. Smoking is a bad thing for Crohn's disease. When someone smokes, it doesn't let the bowel heal. So quitting smoking is the best thing one can do if someone is a smoker. Avoiding medications like ibuprofen and Advil definitely helps. These medications, again, make the condition worse if you take them. Colon cancer. So one of the complications of, of the Crohn's diseases is colon cancer when, when, the, when the colon is affected. If the disease is restricted to the small bowel alone, then there is no risk of colon cancer. When there is colon involvement, it depends on the extent of the colon involvement and the duration of the disease. In general, we think the risk of colon cancer goes up after seven to 10 years of disease. Normally, we recommend colon exam for everyone at age 50 and above for cancer screening. If we don't find any polyps, we would recommend do it every 10 years. If you do find polyps, then it depends on the size, number of polyps, as well as the type of polyps. Based on that, we tell patients to come back in three years, five years, or 10 years. This is for average risk patients. People at 50 and above are average risk patients. Some patients are at much higher level of risk. When someone has a family history of colon cancer, that person is a higher risk of colon cancer than the average person. In those patients, we start screening them at age 40, not at 50, and, and very often they may need in the beginning every five years rather than every 10 years, depending upon how impressive the family history is. And if the person in the family, the first, per, the first per, if the person in the family who had colon cancer is less than 60 years of age, then we start, um, sorry, if the person is less than 50 years of age, then we start 10 years earlier in the patient's relatives. If someone is 48 years of age when they got the colon cancer, then we start screening the family members at 38 and above. If they're 45, 35 and above. Otherwise, we start at, if, if they're older than 50, then we start at 40, irrespective of 50 or 55 or 58, whatever it is. And the patients with ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease are at much higher risk of colon cancer. That's why we recommend them, irrespective of their age. Even if someone had colitis at age 20, and uh, we, we recommend doing colon exams when they are 27 or uh, 30 years of age. We, start, we ask them to have the colon check. And unfortunately, we have to do it every year because the risk of colon cancer is so high that we can't wait for five years, 10 years to do the next one. And when we do the colon exam, we biopsy the colon extensively. We do we pick at least eight spots to biopsy, and each spot we biopsy, we take four biopsies. So at least 32 pieces we get, more the better. So 
why do we do it? We do those biopsies because it is difficult to, when someone has colitis, it is difficult to identify colon cancer, especially the beginning of colon cancer. In normal patients, you have most of them, most of the time they have polyps. The polyps are the one which becomes cancerous. In ulcerative colitis patient, you may not go through uh, ulcerative colitis or Crohn's colitis, you may not go through the same stage. It may be flat, it may, we may be looking at it, right at it and we won't know that's cancerous because it's so subtle. It's very difficult to pick it up. We can miss it. So what we do is we biopsy so many, so many places to look under the microscope and see whether or not that person has a tendency towards cancer. There are some changes that we see. We call that as a dysplasia. So dysplasia, we graded low grade and high grade. Patients who have high grade dysplasia have a very, very high chance of developing cancer. They may even have cancer at that time in the colon that has not been picked up on the colonoscopy. So we actually recommend colon surgery to remove the entire colon so that they don't get colon cancer. Well, Dr. Virapan, that was excellent. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me.